The Bob Murphy Show, episode 99. Welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, folks. My guest today is the economist Don Boudreau. I'm sure many of you know who he is, but for those who don't, let me read some snippets here from his official biography. Donald J. Boudreau is a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a former economics department chair at GMU. He specializes in globalization and trade, law and economics, and antitrust economics. Many of you may know his blog, Cafe Hayek. He founded it with Russ Roberts, but as Don explains in the interview in a minute here, Russ doesn't really blog there much anymore now. He's more focused on econ talk, which I'm sure many of you also follow. Um, Don also in the past was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, and he earned his PhD in economics from Auburn University, and he has a law degree from the University of Virginia. And the last thing I'll mention about him is he wrote a very nice foreword to my book, Choice, that was my uh, distillation of the essential insights in human action. So Don was the guy they got to, to write the forward to that, and it was, it was very nice. And so, you know what? This is an all right guy. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Don Boudreau. Well, Don, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Happy to be here. I'm going to mention I'm at a, one of my apartments. I, I'm like Bernie Sanders. I have places all over the, the country, uh, Don. And just in case, in case the viewers are curious, I, I realized I was looking at the, the shot that is an Axis and Allies game that's that's up there on the on the fridge, just in case people are trying to strain it. I don't want them to be distracted, so that's what that is. Um, so I'm glad to have you here. Like I always do when I have a uh, you know an icon in the in the libertarian movement as a, as a guest. Can you just tell us your background story? How how did you get into this wacky world? Uh, so I am in my early 60s. I was in college in the sort of college in 1976, just after graduated from high school. I'm the oldest of four in a family, and no one ever went to college. My dad dropped out of school in sixth grade, worked in a shipyard, but I had a great family. My mom and father wanted me to go to college, uh, and uh, I had no interest in going to college, but I thought, well, okay, I'll go. I'll go for a year. I'll satisfy them. Then I'll work in the shipyard, as I had done during the summers, uh, uh, and follow in my father's, father's footsteps. Uh, and uh, when I, I'll make a long story short. Uh, I went to a place called Nichols State University in South Louisiana. Didn't know what economics was, but I got stuck in an econ- I got assigned to an economics class. Mm-hmm. I happened to have in the, in in the spring semester of 1977. I happened to have an extremely good teacher, a woman named Michelle Francois, who died just a few years ago, um, and she was just excellent. She uh, it was principles of micro, which I was fortunate to take before principles of macro. That was mm-hmm. a stroke of luck. Um, and to have this great teacher because she she brought economics to life. Uh, growing up, coming of age in the mid 70s, uh, I was surrounded by these shortages: gasoline shortages, energy shortages, natural gas shortages. And uh, uh, she drew a supply and demand curve. I remember on the board one day, and she said, "Look, look what happens when the government imposes a price ceiling. You get a shortage." And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. This. Mm-hmm. this these few lines explaining this this unintended, complicated outcome that was a part of my life. Uh, and it immediately, that explanation immediately made more sense to me than did the explanations that I'd heard before I took economics, that we were running out of oil, uh, that the, that Exxon and Chevron were keeping their tankers out in the Gulf of Mexico in order to drive the price up. Um, and uh, so I be- immediately became hooked because she was such a good teacher. You know, she brought economics to life. It wasn't a, it wasn't a puzzle solving class. It wasn't an exercise in applied mathematics. It was economics about the real world. And she, she was actually very market oriented. And she told me about, about uh, this economist named Bastiat, who I, of course I'd never heard of. Uh, and uh, so I, she, she turned me on to Bastiat. It was another professor at the same school, a guy named Bill Field, who's, who's still alive. He's retired now, living in Texas, uh, who was very much into Hayek and the Austrians. And I started pestering my first economics professor so much that she said, you got to go talk to Dr. Field. Mm-hmm. And so I, he and I became very good friends. Uh, he became my mentor, really, as an undergraduate. And he introduced me to the works of Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ludwig von Mises and Jim Buchanan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so by my by the end of my, I want to say by the, by the part of the middle of my sophomore year, I just wanted to get a PhD in economics. I just loved it so much. And so that's that's how it started with me. 
Okay, great. So uh, up until that point, like, would you say your views were libertarian or is that not even how you thought about the world? No, no I, I, I didn't think about the world. I had no political views. I was interested mm -hmm. in, uh, I drank beer. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a girlfriend. Uh, I was a football, you know, I liked football. I was sort of a typical going nowhere. I wasn't a bad kid. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't one doing drugs or anything, but I was just typical, you know, working class American teenager who was just interested in getting a job and making some money and getting married. Um, uh, I, 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 but libertarianism did kind of speak to me immediately. I mean, my, my, my family's ethos, although they wouldn't have put it, my parents would have put it this way. My family's ethos that was always, uh, be responsible. Don't take other people's stuff. I've written about the story. I remember one of my earliest memories was when I was a young child. I, I, I must have been four or five. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went with my mother to a neighbor's house, Miss Jane. And uh, I remember getting back to our house and I had in my hand a fistful of rubber bands that I had pilfered from Miss Jane's doorknob. And my mother said, where'd you get those rubber bands? And I said, oh, I took them from Miss Jane. Did you ask her for them? No. She said, you stole and I was shocked that I had stolen something. Mm -hmm. And I remember my mom dragging me back to Miss Jane's, and I had to apologize for stealing. My mother told me she was disappointed in me. And so in my family, there was this, there was this ethos of, you know, just mind your own business, don't envy other people. I was never allowed so, to. Don, can I just ask you? Yeah. yeah. So Miss Jane, like, she just kept rubber bands, like, to, you know, you need to use a rubber band, and she happened to store them around her. She, 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 maybe my memory's embellishing things. You know, I you know I, I keep rubber bands at my place, and like they're just you know in a in in, in, in a junk junk drawer if right, I need yeah. one. Uh -huh. So she would put them around a doorknob in her kitchen, like in the yeah. kitchen cabinet. Mm -hmm. And as a five four year old five year old, I was fascinated by by these rubber bands. So I just helped myself yeah. to rubber bands. Um, and uh, you know, I don't I don't re actually remember what Miss what Miss Jane said in reaction, but I remember her being a nice lady. So I'm sure mm -hmm. she went along and said, yes, Donald, you shouldn't have stolen. Right. Uh, but it taught me, it taught me a lesson. And, you know, so, you know, some, you know, five and a half decades later, this lesson still resonates with me. And I think it was always part of, of me. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my parents, although, although poor by American standards, would never tolerate any excuse making, would never tolerate any envy, any expressions of envy of, of other people. It's always, you know, work hard to get what you want. And if you work hard, chances are that you'll, you'll get it. We were taught not to feel sorry for ourselves. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's funny how we, we remember things like, like I can really remember I was in line at school, you know, we were like, like you had to line up to go to gym class or something. You know, I was a little kid and yeah. there was a printout of something on the wall and it was back when the printers like they had um like the printer paper had the 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 holes on the margins you know what I'm talking about yeah. that you know like yeah. the yeah, right, yeah. To, to roll I forget what you call that and yeah. and it was just sitting and I just kind of went up and and tore off you know so the, like the teacher had taped the printout on the wall like explaining something and I just yeah. you know absent-mindedly as we're sitting there waiting in line like ripped it off and the teacher yelled at me and I was so outraged like I didn't do anything wrong. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure you were thinking I wasn't trying to steal. I was just like, Oh, some rubber bands. <laughs> yeah. Until that moment, I didn't think yeah. of myself as a, a thief, but I, my mom, yeah. my mom informed me different. My mom taught me differently. Yeah. And also too, it just, it goes to show, I think that one of the ways I try to get across, like people say, Oh, libertarianism is this weird, you know, extreme social view or something. It's eccentric. And it's like, well, no, actually what you teach your kid at the playground is libertarianism. It's we make all the exceptions you know what I mean? Like you, the, the kids at the playground can't vote. And if six out of 10 decide to take the rich kid's bike, that doesn't make it okay. You know, no, no parent would say let's have an election, but yet that's what the parents do, you know, in November. Yeah. Or, or, or no parent would, would be proud of uh, a child who comes back home and, and, and expresses uh, uh, envy that, right. you know, a classmate has nicer jeans or drives a nicer car. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents would have, uh, uh, put me straight if I had had done such such things. They would not have been proud of me at all. They would have been ashamed, rightly so. Right, and they would, yeah, they could have said, well, if you really want that, you know, you can go get a job or da da da. Which, is what, they, know, which yeah. is what they did, you know, mm -hmm. on, on on occasions when I said, you know, uh, I, I, I I like this or that. Said, well, nothing stopping you, boy. Go out and, go out and work for yeah. it. <laughs> okay, so can you tell us a little bit, like, how did you end up at GMU, and just you know, fill in that gap of the story. 
Bob, I had my, my life is a series of lucky breaks. It really mm -hmm. is. And I don't say that in, 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 in false modesty. Um, so I I began my graduate. Bill, Bill Field got me interested in Austrian economics. And this is when NYU's Austrian program was, was probably at, at its zenith. Mm -hmm. The Israel Kirzner was active. Uh, Jerry O'Driscoll, Mario Rizzo was there. What, during my time there, Jerry left and Larry White came. This is the early 80s. I was at NYU from 80 to 82. But I was not despite the fact that I took and did well in math classes as an undergraduate, uh, I didn't have the mathematical chops really mm -hmm. to get through any program, or, or I feared that I didn't. Um, and so I took a master's degree at, at NYU and transferred to Auburn because I had met Roger Garrison mm -hmm. visiting NYU during my first year there. And Roger and I hit it off. He said, you know, we have this program at Auburn. We're just starting this PhD program. You should come down. In retrospect, it's kind of a dumb move, leaving an established program like NYU to go to, to Auburn, which is a football school. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I wound up being the first econ PhD from that school. Uh, but I, 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 New York was too much for me at the time. I didn't have any money at all. Um, so I went to Auburn. It turned out I was very, very good. I wanted to write my dissertation under Bob Eakland. Mm -hmm. um, and Bob, one of Bob's best friends and co-authors is the late uh, Bob Tolleson. Mm -hmm. Tolleson was in the mid-80s on the faculty at, uh, at GMU. And uh, because of Bob's recommendation, I got a, I got a job interview at, at George Mason in 1985. Uh, my job talk, I remember it very well. Uh, it was on Frank Knight and the theory of the firm. And Jim Buchanan was there, Gordon Tullock was there, Bob Tolleson was there. It was not a good job talk. I remember walking out of the room thinking, oh my gosh, I, I blew it. But at least I had the opportunity to interview a person like George Mason. And then Karen Vaughn, who was the department chairman, called me two days later and said, congratulations, we're offering you a job. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this, was, this was 85. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm- Can I I'm, ask you, did you know yeah. enough to be like somewhat intimidated by those some of those names you just rattled off or did you not know yeah, who they well, were? Was, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so when I was at Auburn, I mean, you know, I, when I was an undergraduate, I had I, I started reading Hayek and Mises. I started, I'd already read Buchanan. I read some of Tulloch. Um, uh, and then during my three years at Auburn, 82 to 85, by the way, I was all, lucky at Auburn also. Uh, Leland Yeager was a visiting professor at Auburn during mm -hmm. my time. He later joined the faculty permanently. And so I learned macro from Leland Yeager. And mm -hmm. so I, I, so I, I had a tremendously good education. And so I, by the time... I'm interviewing at GMU. Yeah, I know who Bob Tolleson is. Jim Buchanan's already a hero of mine. Uh, I, you know, I, I know of Karen Vaughn, Don Lavoy. Uh, he probably also helped. He and I overlapped. His last year in NYU was my first year, and mm -hmm. Don hit it off well. Um, and Jack Hyde was in the faculty, uh, and and uh, Walter Williams, uh, I, I, who I of course knew of. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was I was intimidated. Uh, and uh, and very fortunate. And so I, uh, George Selgin and I were hired both as junior faculty in the fall of '85 at at, at GMU. And uh, uh, so that 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 was my biggest single break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to ask you when you mentioned NYU if you had overlapped when Don Lavoy was there. Do you? And that's a name that I think a lot of people who are fans of the Austrian school they they hear his name cited. They know maybe he had something to do with the socialist calculation, but they don't know much or maybe hermeneutics. Can you just yeah. speak a little bit about you know what he what he was doing? Because like I said, I, I think a lot of people know the name, but they don't really know what he did. Unfortunately, Don died at the tender age of fifty one of mm -hmm. uh, a very aggressive cancer back in uh, November of uh, two thousand one. Uh, Don was temperamentally a man of the left. He looked like a guy on the left. You know, he he dressed, you know, in in uh, sort of left. I don't know the title. You know, he you know he dressed in a uh, you know sort of baggy clothes. He had wispy hair. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't well groomed. Uh, his background was computer science. He was he's from from New England, uh, and, and I don't know the full details, but somehow through his through his studies of how order emerges in computer programming. He, got, he gets interested in, in economics. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the Austrians are very much into studying how order emerges spontaneously. Um, Don completed his dissertation at NYU in the spring of 81, writing under Israel Kirzner. Uh, his dissertation it was published in 1985 by Cambridge University Press uh, under the title of Rivalry in Central Planning, which was a 
uh, not only a history of the socialist calculation debate uh, involving Mises and Hayek, of course, uh, but he 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 brought life to it. He explained the the underlying logic of what Mises and Hayek were were doing, and 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 made it accessible, more accessible perhaps than it otherwise would be. Um, and also that same year, 1985, Don published another book that, by, uh, uh, through the Cato Institute called uh, uh, National Economic Planning, What is Left, mm -hmm. uh, which is a deep and brilliant expose of all the fallacies that uh, under law, uh, all the fallacies that, that, that are at the heart of proposals for, for, for national economic planning, you know, which is sort of a uh, you know, reduced form version of socialism. You know, we're going to have socialism in, you know, in, in part. Uh, but Lavoie was an incredibly deep and sophisticated thinker. Now, you mentioned hermeneutics. He he did spend, toward the end of his life, he spent a lot of time looking at continental, reading continental philosophy and, and you know, pondering how to interpret texts. I, I, I'm not much into that stuff, so I, I haven't read mm -hmm. that much of Don's work on that front. But, I you know, I respect his work as a scholar. Mm -hmm. And and the work that I know, and the work that 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 gives gives him the greatest uh, 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 fame in, right. in, in the audience sources are these two remarkably good 1985 books of his. They, they're they're I'll, I'll urge your your audience that even though they're 35 years old now, each is each remains timely and accessible. Um, in fact, in some sense, more timely and accessible than they have been in sure. decades. I don't mean to put you on the yeah. spot, but like, is there anything where you can think of that? someone who just reads like the classics on, you know, like, you know, Mises original thing or Hayek's stuff w wouldn't get, but you read Lavoie and like he, he did something that pulled it together or. Uh, so in, in, in national economic planning, he pulls together, he, he, he explains in a way that I think is un, unmatched uh, the, the, the depth of the knowledge problem that confronts, uh, government officials who would try to pick pick industry winners either mm -hmm. through use of subsidies or or restrictive tariffs. Uh, uh, it, it's it, it's it's Don was such a nuanced and sophisticated thinker. I don't have a, a, a you know a line to throw out to right. summarize it, but but he, he he it is the single best. That book remains to me the single best refutation of all the pretensions that underlie proposals for national. Uh, uh, industrial policy that I've ever read. I mean, even just the title involving rivalry there, I mean, so that's implicit, but is that like one of his themes that that's really what's important is you need to have different yes. loci yeah. or loci of, of control yeah. and, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that in, in the rivalry book, you know, the, 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 the dissertation that he later expanded into this book on, on the socialist calculation debate, I mean, it's not just a history of thought on the socialist calculation. Mm -hmm. It is that too, but it's a book that brings out the importance of 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 rivalry and how this rivalry um, uh, uh, dis discovers and refines and polishes uh, and then disp disperses in usable ways the knowledge that's necessary for an economy to to not only to sustain itself but to grow. Yeah, I mean, just an example of that kind of thing. I don't know who first came up with it, but I remember I think it might have been Hayek mentioning. Like the problem with doing cost plus pricing for utility regulation, yeah. like, oh yeah, it costs yeah. this much to generate electricity and give the shareholders, you know, X percent profit is that it, it's not a fact of nature. How much does it cost to deliver a kilowatt hour of electricity to somebody? It's, that's exactly right. That, that's mm -hmm. a really good example. And and Don does a marvelously good job of making that clear in the rivalry and central planning book. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. L let me ask you this while we're talking about, it. I heard this what may be an urban legend. So maybe you can confirm or deny. Somebody told me one time that Lavoy used to, when he was at New York would go undercover and go into Marx's reading groups and like win their trust over months with his mastery of Marxism. And then at the last meeting, blow it up and walk out. Is that true? So, so I can't, I can't confirm it for sure. Cause I, I didn't witness. Mm -hmm. I, I too have, have heard that. Mm -hmm. I can confirm that is perfectly within uh, Don's personality trait. He, okay. He was deeply read in in Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever met anyone who was better read in Marx. And he had a respect for Marx that was genuine. Uh, mm -hmm. Like one of the few things that Don was unable to convince me of is that I should respect Marx as much as 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 he did. As uh -huh. he, did. Um, but he 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 did know Marx very well, and it would be like him to go into one of those meetings. And the way he looked physically, 
he would have fit right in. <laughs> right. You could put a chase shirt on on Don Lavoy, and it would it would look not out of place. <laughs> that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, I I I like more when a kind of, like you know Bombavik and Karl Marx in the clothes of his system or something where they really get into the theory and stuff you might not, one might not have known. In, in other words, merely they're just saying, oh well, look at how many millions of people died under communism. Case closed. I mean, that's an important thing to bring up, but yeah. in terms of you know, grappling with Marxism, like to say, well, what's it's, you know, the mechanism for which, you know, interest is generated and that kind of stuff. That's, yeah. That's no, he, stuff. He, he treated Marx as a serious economic scholar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me um, shift gears a little bit to then ask you, well, another big thing we mentioned GMU. Um, so you are one of the co-bloggers at, at Cafe Hayek. Do you want to tell us the background story of how that happened? So I'm the only blogger at Cafe Hayek now. Cafe Hayek was started by Russ Roberts and myself when mm -hmm. Russ was Russ was my uh, colleague from 2003 when we hired him until he left in 2012 to take a full time position at the Hoover. Uh, Russ gradually just moved away from from blogging. He started Econ Talk, uh, okay. which is you know terrific, okay. wonderful uh, um, podcast series. And he devotes all of his time to that and some other projects. So Russ stopped blogging. It wasn't a formal decision. He just sort of drifted away from it. And he hasn't blogged to Cafe Hayek in, in, in years. And so I now regard it as I think Russ does as, you know, my blog. Uh, Russ came to me. But but you guys formed it simultaneously. Like you were both there from the inception? We were both from the start. Okay. It was it was Don Boudreaux's and Russ Roberts's I got you. blog. In fact, the first couple of blog posts on it were written by, by Russ Roberts. And I remember, Bob. So the reason that got started, and as you know, I, I write these letters to the editor, mm -hmm. which, which I've always done. I mean, I was writing letters to the editor when literally I was putting them in envelopes and sticking them in the mailbox and mailing them to the places. It's a way for me to vent my spleen. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of my, my speed, little short ditties. And uh, so Russ knew I did these letters to the editor. I would share them with him. And I remember him coming to my office one day. I had just learned of blogging because Tyler Cowen and Alex Tabarrok not long ago before had started Marginal Revolution, which is the first blog I was aware of. Mm -hmm. I still wasn't quite sure what blogging was about or what it was. And I remember Russ said, we, you and I ought to start a blog. And I remember not wanting to. I said, well, what's the point of a blog? I write these letters to the editor. And I now email them. And there's this magic thing called email. I send them out. Email us. No, no. So Ru it was Russ's determination that we start a blog. And uh, I, I probably was – I didn't – play as active a role as I should have played with Russ in starting it. And Russ threw out some names and, you know, I was, okay, well, yeah, Cafe Hayek, that sounds better. I don't remember what the other names were, but, okay, we'll do that one. And Russ gets it started. And I remember he had to come into my office a few weeks after it started. He said, Don, you got a blog. I said, Russ, I want to do it. And so he actually sat down at my, with me at my chair. He said, look, here's how you do it. And he, he, he walked me through the steps of how to open up this thing and, mm -hmm. and, and I had some little post, some little letter I was writing, working on, and that became my first blog post. And I remember immediately, because you know, it's, it's like instant gratification. The minute, the minute you, you hit, you hit, you know, post, it, it's there, it's published, it's like a publication. Right. And I remember, oh, this is pretty good. And so I got hooked right away. And so when people tell me, you probably feel the same way. When people tell me, ah, oh, you know, I really admire all the work you put into your blog. I think I, I, say, I say thank you, but my my, my secret reaction is. It's not work at all. It's 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 just it's it's enjoyment and pleasure. I mean, every now and then, I feel the ob obligation to put something up that I really don't feel like putting up. But mm -hmm. most, it's just a, lo a labor of love. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember much about the title, but yeah, because I was wondering, like, did you guys first say, okay, what are we going to write about, and then what's the title for that, or you know, I mean, because it's not like every post has to do with Hayek. Or with no, ca with cafes very, for that matter. So relatively few, relatively mm -hmm. few do. So it was never intended to be a a, a blog about Hayek. Right. Um, I remember early on uh, when I when I when Russ convinced me, okay, let's do a blog. I remember telling Tyler Cowen, I remember saying, you know, I, I think I'm gonna, we're going to do this blog, and I'm going to devote it to, to to trade policy. That's what I'm most mm -hmm. interested. in. And Tyler said, no, 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 no. He says, a, uh, no blog devoted to a specific policy has any hope of 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 surviving. Um, and he was probably right about that. Mm -hmm. uh, although Tyler later went on to start a blog on the vote of the avian flu issues, which did not survive. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. It, it wasn't, wasn't long, long lasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, if you read Cafe Hike, you know, that probably 60% or at least 50% of my blog posts have something to do with some trade, some trade right. policy. Okay. Yeah. It, it is a, a paradox of, um, you know, I don't know if marketing is the right word, but 
like if like you, there's some Twitter accounts that I follow, and you're right. And with some, if it's like an established public intellectual, like say, yeah, whatever they post on is great. But yeah. with other things, like if it's topic oriented, it's almost like the narrow. Like if it's just a a Twitter account devoted to cute pictures, that's too general. Whereas if it's like cute pictures of kittens going down a slide, yeah, you know, and they, and so everyone just knows. Oh, if I have a picture like that, I send it to that account. You know what I mean? So it's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is, you know, to distinguish yourself because now, yeah, everybody's got a blog. And so you got to have something that's, that's somewhat specific. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, Russ knew I greatly admired Hayek. Right. And, uh, and, 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 and Russ always liked Hayek. But when he came, the blog was started in 04. Russ arrived here in, in the fall of 03. Mm-hmm. And he immediately started reading more of Hayek. And he became, you know, more and more intrigued with and enamored with Hayek's work. So uh, by the time we started the blog in April of 04, Russ was was also an admirer of, of Hayek, probably on par with, with myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you brought up something I was going to ask you that, yeah, I think w- when I'm trying to like, we tell people like, oh yeah, I'm going to have Don Boudreau on and they're like, you know, which, and I'll be you know, the guy that writes all the op-eds like, oh yeah, that guy. So yeah. <laughs> how did that become, you know, your, your stock and trade as it were? Oh, so letters to the editor to more my, <laughs> my stock and trade. Um... Oh, did I say op ed yeah, yeah. I yeah. meant to say letters to the editor. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I write a few op-eds, uh, mm-hmm. but you know. Um, no, I just misspoke. I meant to say letters yeah. to the editor. Um, yeah. It, it, so early on, you know, that I realized they were they were easy to get published, and, and you know, it's 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 a rush to see your name in print. Right. And I remember during you know, during my first stint at George Mason back in the mid eight mid and late eighties, I would send letters to the Wall Street Journal, and you know, then it took a couple of weeks. And, you know, open the Wall Street Journal. Oh, there's your name. It's in print, right? And that's kind of a rush. And, and, yeah. and they're not hard to write. Uh, and so I would start writing these letters and then I would send them to people. When I became president of Fee uh, in 1997, um, I, had a, I had fundraising duties. And this was just as emails really getting going. And, I, you know, it's kind of icky raising money because – and you, so I, I didn't want my donors to hear from me only when they thought I was there to, to beg them for, for, right. for, for money. Oh, yeah. So as a fee, uh, I, I would write these I, – I'd write these letters to the editor and I, and I would send them out by email and I, and I would send them to a lot of my, my donors or, or mm-hmm. would-be donors. And so they would hear from me mostly not when I'm asking them for money but when I'm – you know, they, they would see me you know, joining the fight, you know, you know right. making a case for – for economic liberty, making the case for limited government, um, and uh, and then people would ask, "Oh, can you put me on that on, on your email list?" And I, thought, I was always flattered. Of course, I'll put you on my mm-hmm. my email list. And then it it it, it, it then it, it came a point. I'm not sure exactly when, where I felt almost obliged every day to wake up and write a letter to the editor and <laughs> and, and 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 send it. And so Cafe Hayek really emerged from that because Russ saw in this letter writing thing of mine, these would make good blog posts. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I still write letters to the editor, although um, I will confess publicly here, uh, m- most of my letters now I don't even send to the publication. I just, they're, they're more valuable to me to put up immediately on on the blog. Mm-hmm. Some of them I do. Uh, I have, for example, I have one in today's Wall Street Journal, coincidentally enough. Uh, but I, I'm but, glad you found it because I was wondering, but I didn't want to put you on the spot because you know he was asking a magician to re- reveal his secret, so I didn't. I wasn't going to ask you, but I was no, curious. It's valuable <laughs> for me to put him on my blog, but you know, if 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 I have a sense that a letter, if I write a letter to the New York Times, um, and, and I can have I have a pretty good sense now whether it has any prospect of publication at all. If it does, uh, I won't post it on the blog, and I'll send it to the Times instead because if it's posted on the blog, the Times won't publish it. Okay. But if it's a letter that I'm pretty sure has a slim to no chance that the, that the Times will publish it, it'll be addressed to the Times, right. but I'll put it up immediately on my on my blog. Yeah, I, so I, would say, yeah. I would say maybe a third of the letters that I write actually get sent, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even less. The majority are posted immediately and never sent. Okay. Yeah, I think Russ was right because it is a good – hook like it, it's um you know it's not a huge investment of time for the reader and then if it's an issue you care about like with the one cares about yeah you might you know because you'll say oh in regards to so-and-so's op-ed from january 22nd you know three fallacies and so if the person really cares they can go click and see what did the per- you know what i mean so it is a good thing where 
you can kind of very quickly decide to how deeply do I want to wade into this dispute. And it is more fun to like see a debate. Like I think that's why debates are so popular in general that people like to see two different viewpoints going head to head. Right. Right. Yeah. So a lot of what you write on, as you mentioned, is, is the topic of free trade. So maybe we could spend a bit on that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead. I mean, is, are you doing, why do you focus so much on trade policy? Is it because you think that's like the most essential thing or just, you, I'll go ahead and just. Well, so uh, uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, trade policy, tr trade became my specialty almost by, by accident. I took a class in international trade at, at NYU from Fritz Mockler just because I wanted to take a class from Mockler. Oh, okay. And I did very well uh, in it. I, I liked it, but I, you know, Mockler could have taught anything. I would have taken a class from, mm -hmm. from Mockler. Um, so um, just a little bit of background. So I, I, my first job was at George Mason. Uh, I was interested in antitrust back then. And so I went to law school in order to, you know, bone up on the legal aspects of antitrust. And uh, by the time I got out of law school, I'd lost interest in antitrust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and fortunately, antitrust was, was then pretty much uh, dead, not dead, but somnolent, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, and so I, my, I got a job out of law school at Clemson, and I'm, I'm the low person on the totem pole. Clemson had an MBA program, and uh, uh, all the students, based in Europe, all the students would come to Clemson in the summer. And it was a capstone course in international economics, a trade course. Mm -hmm. So I get to Clemson, they point to me and say, well, you, you're, teaching, you're teaching this class because no one else in Clemson wanted to teach international trade. So I had to teach the class. And uh, I didn't expect to enjoy teaching the class because I really didn't do any trade stuff. Uh, but I loved teaching the class. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, so that's how I became interested in in in, in trade. Um, and um, uh, but but another part of the story is economic ignorance just drives me bananas, as I'm sure it does you too. It's just to see mm -hmm. blatant economic ignorance. And there's no field in economics that uh, 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 gives rise to, or that is the subject of more economic misunderstanding than than trade. Uh, it, 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 you know, protectionism is just, is, 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 is rampant and merc mercantilist fallacies continue. And, and so I encounter these all the time and I, I just like the bunking. It's like playing whack-a-mole, of course, not right. this one down, when it pops up. Um, but part of the reason, Bob, is, is, you know, it, 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 I don't find it that trade's not that difficult. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's, it, it, I don't have to tap into you know, the deeper recesses of, of whatever deep theoretical knowledge I have in order to make interesting points about why this particular argument for tariffs or that particular argument for export subsidies uh, is, is fallacious. And, you just, mm -hmm. uh, you're, and it is, and I do find it to be a challenge. Uh, it's one I enjoy uh, trying to figure out new ways to make the argument, you know, new analogies, new reductios. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes I think it works better than others, but, but trade, trade's just, it, 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 I write on it so much because I think it's a, it's an area in which the fallacies, particularly you know in the last few years, particularly the fallacies run so, so hot and heavy. Yeah, um, I don't. You had some. Unfortunately, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I really liked um, something about the idea of if we're running a trade deficit, that means we're like we're living above our means. Yeah. And, yeah. and and you've I mean I don't want to put you on a spot like it's it's fine if you just yeah, yeah. Punt, well, so, but I mean can you think I, I really wish it could rem it was at my fingertips a minute ago that's why I was bringing it up but now I can't remember but there was some some argument you used or some analogy that really like showed why that is not necessarily yeah, I, I the right way to the, think the, about it the, the particular uh, got, I, I, I've written many and I don't mm -hmm. remember the particular one you have in mind but but uh, you know it, it's it's I mean it, on this issue even competent economists, uh, the late Martin Felstein, I think, was although very good, he was very bad on this issue. He, he would say, "Oh well, the trade deficit means whenever we're on a trade deficit, it means we're going into debt to foreigners," uh, and it doesn't mean that at all. It can mean that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but if, if a simple example would be if if uh, if uh, you're in Canada and, and and I'm in the U.S. and uh, uh, I buy something from you with U.S. dollars, and you take those dollars and you then uh, by stock on the New York Stock Exchange. Well, that increases the U.S. trade deficit because you've invested in America. You didn't use your dollars to buy things from America, uh, but you own this stock. Well, there's no debt. No one owes you anything. Uh, you just mm -hmm. you own, own an asset. 
And then what people will say is, oh, well, assets have been transferred from Americans to foreigners. Um, uh, 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 and, and that's true. And if you only look at that part of the equation, it looks like Americans are at, made asset poorer. But um, uh, at the amount of capital in the world isn't fixed. Right. And so if 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 you take the the dollars uh, or if, if the American who sells you the stock take the dollars and you know starts a new company with those dollars and the Americans capital stock can go up if it's a successful company um, and so there there are a lot of confusions around around the I, I wrote just today mm. I don't think any any concept in all of economics is responsible for as much certainly not more mischief and policy misunderstanding than the trade deficit yeah I think you're flirting with the thing that I, that you you know, got me to think through. It was something like you had an example where something like if Japanese investors wanted to open a car factory in the United States, technically, you know, those operations would boost the trade deficit for that period. Yeah. It, which you can think of too. Like if they literally just sent over concrete and glass and steel and stuff to then yeah. construct a building on U S soil, like aliens looking at it would say, Oh, there's more goods flowing into the United States than are flowing the other way. And so, therefore, that that's an import. There's no corresponding. That's a trade deficit, or that contributes yeah. to the trade deficit. And yet, that would you know provide jobs for U.S. workers and blah blah. You know, so and and yeah, yeah, there is a sense in which they would be acquiring the assets now in the United States because even if they were just renting the you know the real estate, you know what I mean. So you you don't even have to say they bought the land. In which case, you could say the American. So there, it'd be like yeah, they're gaining shares of U.S. based assets. Yeah. So, and that explains like the capital account surplus for the, you know, the current account deficit, but it's, you're right. It's not like Americans have fewer assets now. Like the, so anyway, examples like that really showed how some of the accounting leads to really counterintuitive things that the trade deficit can be misleading about. Yeah. And, 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 you know, at, at any more base level, the language is so confusing. The language is, is understandably confusing to trade deficit. You know, mm -hmm. deficit sounds bad. People actually equate it with the budget deficit. As you know, I mean, there is this connection between a trade deficit and, mm -hmm. a, and, 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 a, and a budget deficit to the extent that uh, foreigners buy U.S. treasuries. Um, um, uh, and, and obviously, the more Uncle Sam borrows, the greater the number of U.S. treasuries available to foreign, for foreigners to buy. Uh, so there is this connection, but but people mistake the term deficit in the term trade deficit as meaning the same thing that deficit uh, means in the phrase government budget deficit. And the right. two, government budget deficit does mean the government is going further into debt, uh, right. putting aside money creation. Um, but a trade deficit does not mean that Americans are, are going further into debt, although it, it, it could mean that. Yeah, and I'm glad, you know, you're mentioning that here. So let me just, for the sake of completeness, so normally what happens for the listeners who don't know is I read your stuff and I only blog about it when I disagree with you. So it sort of yeah, <laughs> it might yeah, come up and yeah, I always preface yeah, it saying, you know, I, I yeah. had some exchanges in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so I, of course I always preface it by saying the only reason I mentioned it is because I agree with 99.9. .9. And so there's just, so in yours is, is actually, it's more like, I just think it might mislead someone. It's not that you say something that I think is actually wrong, but, but yeah. So let me just mention and have you respond that, yeah, my concern with some of the, you know, standard libertarianist rhetoric people will say something along the lines of uh, not only is a trade deficit not bad, but actually we're getting more stuff for our exports. So isn't that a good thing? And so there the issue is, okay, so does that mean a trade surplus then is bad and that the interventionist should go be taught? And, and so that's, there's, there's that kind of thing where you're, they make it, they almost flip it. Like it's necessarily a sign of prosperity when like you're saying it's, it could be. It it, 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 it it could be it could be it, it could be a sign of of uh, of economic decline. I mean, I, you know, I mean, a simple example would be if, if all of us Americans decide, you know, we want to have a gigantic party. So we liquidate all of our assets, sell them to foreigners. Uh, you know, we throw a, you know, a big party, wake up tomorrow, you know, hungover and, and, and destitute. Right. Uh, now, you know, we will have done it, but it wouldn't be foreigners fault. You know, we, right. we chose to do it. Um, and so it could be it could be evidence of, of bad economic decision making on our part, uh, but it but it but it could also be evidence of good economic decision making. You know, we right. we provide a policy environment in which foreign investors uh, find us to be relatively attractive to other places. So they want to they want to invest money in, want to build factories here. They want to uh, 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 you know increase the sizes of their operations here. 
uh, and all of that would be would, would be sign of, of 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 economic prudence and 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 excellence here rather than of dissipation. Right. And even there, what's funny is like I, I realize we're like doing third and fourth level analysis here, but why not? Um, yeah. It's it it wouldn't be the case. Like so, even yes, even though we can imagine, yes, there are scenarios where a high trade deficit would be the result of choices that are not sustainable, let's say, and that, you know, the normal person would look at and say, that's irresponsible or profligate. Um, even there, though, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's a bad thing. Like, you know, somebody who's 85 years old might be drawing down his retirement account. That's right. And that's that does right. that, you know, taking vacations, you know, taking his grandkids on cruises and stuff. And he might be consuming more each year than his portfolio is generating an income on capital gains and dividends and whatever. And that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And then yeah. even if it were, even if you did identify cases, you know, like a teenager running up the credit card bills, and you know, that's my favorite go-to example is to say a teenager's running just a capital account surplus when he's running up the credit card bill and spending more than his job pays. We wouldn't say he's being responsible, showing what a great investment opportunity he is. You might say, no, son, you got to stop doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even yeah. so, the local mayor putting a tariff in place on the teenager isn't helping the teenager any by doing that, you know? So, so even in cases where, yeah, we can agree with common sense, you know, normal man on the street logic. Yep. That's irresponsible. They're, they're squandering their wealth. It's not clear how levying taxes on some of their transactions fixes the problem. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if we to, to, to go to the example I gave earlier, the extreme example, if, if we all became, you know, if our time preference became, you know, something like immediate mm -hmm. and we just wanted to, you know, you know, have maximum uh, 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 pleasure today. And so we we're going to liquidate all of our assets to do that. Uh, it's hard to imagine how a tariff will somehow make us prudent. I mean, if we're intent on being imprudent <laughs> and irresponsible, uh, it's highly unlikely that a tariff is going to change that. We'll find some way to be <laughs> imprudent and, and, and irresponsible if that's what we're about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, moving aside from the, the strict economics of it, can you speak a little bit, what's your sense? Because what's interesting to me is how much, and obviously it's, you know, I think Donald Trump is the two word answer, but is, is there more involved? Like it, it used to be that it was the, you know, I don't want to necessarily say Democrats, but the people who generally weren't in favor of markets that were skeptical of foreign trade and outsourcing, like those were typical sort of leftist anti-market complaints. Oh, the poor worker compared to the vagaries of the, you know, soulless yeah. corporation. And, yeah. and now it seems that it's flipped where it's more the populist right that doesn't yeah. trust free trade. And, you know, my joke is I wish Trump would start bashing the fed so that, Democrats, you know, would be anti, or sorry, I, I messed up yeah, my joke. I, yeah, I wish yeah, Trump yeah, would, yeah. would embrace the Fed so that, you know, Nancy Pelosi all of a sudden would realize the virtues yeah. of free banking. But in any event, um, so can you speak speak to that a little bit? Because yeah. it does seem like it's it's changed significantly. Right, with, 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 with this one preface, I mean, if you listen to Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on trade, they're just as bad as Trump in some okay. cases, mm -hmm. some cases even worse. Uh, but, but you're right, I mean, Trump has completely moved away from the line that was that was the standard Republican Party, American conservative line on trade from about the mid '70s until time Trump came along. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously in practice, Reagan and 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 the Bushes were not as good on trade as as their talking points. But you know, they they but at least they yeah they were deviating from their talking points. That's the right. issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tr Trump, Trump, and I believe I believe the man is sincere in this regard. Trump, I believe, genuinely thinks that. Mercantilists. They believe that, merc that that imports are bad because uh, they cause money to flow out of America, and exports are good because they cause money to flow in, uh, which is you know typical mercantilist uh, uh, way of looking at the world. Um, and so, why it, it, one thesis? I don't I don't know the answer fully. Uh, one part of the answer may be that in a lot of ways, a narrative that was told on the left has come back for a long time has come back to bite them. Uh, you know, since about the late 1990s, mid 1990s, even uh, this this claim had been has been common that ordinary Americans' living standards reached a peak in the mid 1970s and have leveled off ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, all the, all economic gains have gone only to the top one percent. You know, so the the the, the rich are getting richer, uh, the poor and middle class are at best treading water. And this was taken; it's still believed by a lot of people. Uh, to be well, it, 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 of course it's true. Look, oh, middle Americans haven't gotten a raise since 1973 or 1975. Uh, 
And uh, I don't know this for sure, but I think it's not implausible that, you know, at some point, you know, ordinary Americans pay attention. All right, well, that's true. We haven't gotten a raise. Here comes Donald Trump saying, well, you haven't gotten a raise mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, in all, all this time. And, and, and people who aren't, you know, sensibly, who aren't enamored of, of the welfare state and, 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 you know, standard fair progressive redistribution, uh, they, they might warm up to, to Trumpian claims that, yeah, it's due to trade with low wage countries. We burn all these trade deficits. It's, I mean, it's no coincidence that the U.S. trade, last time the U.S. US ran a trade deficit, a trade surplus was 1975, right about the time our living standards supposedly reached the plateau. Um, so that's, that, 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 that's one reason. Another part of the explanation is, you know, I mean, you know, the Americans' commitment to free trade and understanding of free trade has never been very deep. Uh, uh, they don't understand it like economists understand it. They're not mm -hmm. committed to it in the way that libertarians are committed to it. Uh, and so if someone comes along with a message and, an, and, and a personality that they like, uh, they just sign on for the whole package. Yeah. And so Trump comes along and he's, he is, you know, refreshingly anti-PC. Uh, and so people sign on for that, 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 that whole package. Um, it's unfortunate, but they do. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, cause you brought up the, uh, you know, the still statistics about the early seventies. So what a paper, I don't know if it's actually been published yet. It was like, I wrote it to be part of this volume, um, where I took those claims about middle, you know, the median wages or like those alleged, uh, disparity between productivity growth versus average yeah. pay. I'm sure you've seen those things like that. Economic Policy Institute puts out all these things. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so, and I know there's lots of ways that free market types have gone through and looked and said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't include, you know, benefits and stuff like that. And, you know, oh, okay, and that's all fine. Yeah. But what I did is I took it at face value. And I said, okay, a lot of people try to use those charts to somehow show that Ronald Reagan's bad. But I was yeah. like, no, their own numbers show the turnaround happened in the early 70s. Yeah. You know, so that wasn't Reagan tax cuts. Yeah. Gee, what was it that changed that fundamentally altered the nature of the American economy in the early '70s? And I, of course, I said maybe going off gold had something to do with it. So, and I'm wondering too with the you know trade barrier. I know some economists have argued that there's something about you know going off the gold standard fully at that, that moment. You know, the Richard Nixon did it. That, that has something to do with. Um, yeah, you know, why it, is it that the trade deficit? Do, do you buy into that at all, or do you think it's not just market forces I mean, I think, and globalization? I mean, I think, I, one thing I always say, I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. well, you know, this is a, this is an obvious point. You know, the the you know, we live in a highly complex complex world, and so all right. kind of things are changing. And uh, you know, the, the narrative that I'm referring to. Uh, This very simple line of causality, right? So deregulation begins in around 77, the move for the and tax cut. So you get airline deregulation, Proposition 13 in California. So this is, you know, the Reagan era begins a few years before Reagan actually begins on Carter's watch. Well, that's kind of close to the time when um, uh, the, 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 the income start to stagnate. So it must be, the stagnation must be caused by the tax cutting and the, and the deregulation. Now, I think that's the main I, um, the, the the main argument, but if if you look at trends in trade, for example, uh, you don't find at that time any significant change in the rate of import growth, any significant change in the rate of export growth. Uh, there is a very complex story to be told about why uh, the trade deficits started in earnest in 1976, mm -hmm. uh, and that does have something to do with the change in the monetary regime tracing back to Nixon getting us off the gold standard and you're moving to completely flexible exchange rates. Um, uh, but uh, a, 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 a different version of what you say, maybe, or maybe it's, may, maybe it, 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 you, something you say remind us. I, I, whenever I tell the story, I often say, look, uh, this story about when I say that middle, because I, I, I believe in middle Americans have, in fact, greatly improved in their living standards. Um, I, I, I'm unfortunate enough to be old enough to remember middle class living standards in 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 America in the mid 1970s. I was in my teens, and uh, uh, so if I were a, a person of the left, I, I wouldn't deny the story. I'd say, "Yeah, look, it's great. Yeah, look, you know, we we have you know we've had Americans with Disabilities Act." Uh, yeah, there's been some deregulation, but this, you know, government's still around. We've had, we've had, uh, uh, you know, uh, other government, uh, other government programs. It, it, it shows the durability of Social Security and mm -hmm. of, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, the, you know the, the minimum wage, which we haven't gotten rid of. So all this shows the, the you know the, the goodness of the state, rather than testifying to the the badness of of markets. Okay, that's interesting. So I'm not getting you right. You you went to Texas Tech and gave a a talk there, right? Within yes, I yeah. think I saw you. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um. I don't know. Yeah, you had some great stuff. Were, were you like using a Sears catalog or something? Yes. Can yes, you can you tell the listeners a little, just you know I don't know if you remember yeah. the numbers, but what were you do, what were you doing with a Sears catalog? What does that have to do with this claim about middle I get income? This idea. I, I got the idea from mm -hmm. uh, Mike Cox and, and Richard Alm, who wrote a wonderful book published in 1999 called Myths of Rich and Poor. And one of the chapters in that book is to say, look, yes, adjusting for inflation is a problem. Uh, so let's 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 try to do away with the need to adjust for inflation, right? What's a good way? Well, let's look at the let's look at the nominal prices of things at some time in the past. Let's look at the nominal wage that ordinary workers earned uh, at that same time in the past, and then figure out how many hours a typical worker had to work in order to earn enough income to buy any of these you know normal goods, right? right? Ordinary common goods. And so the 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 first and very well maybe the only thing actually I've ever bought on eBay was a 1975 Sears catalog. Mm -hmm. I remember going to eBay 2007, 2008, and uh, found this catalog, and I bid on it, it was 99 cents. And uh, uh, shockingly, no one else was bidding on it, I bought it for 99 cents, and uh, I, I paid uh, $20 to have it shipped to me overnight. Not that I needed it overnight, I wasn't in a hurry for it, but I wanted to be able to honestly say, because I knew I was gonna give a talk with it, uh, that I had to ship to me overnight, because I wanted to compare life today with life in the mid 70s, uh, mm -hmm. 1975. It was a fall winter 75 catalogs. That's when I'm starting my senior year of high school. And uh, so it had, you know, and Sears, as you know, was the great retailer to middle America, right? Uh, and so you can go through the Sears catalog and clothing and kitchen appliances, tools, you know, exercise equipment uh, and you know, office supplies, automobile supplies. And you can find, look at the prices in there. And then I happen to remember that 1970, so because I've given this talk, in 1975, the, the ordinary, as this Bureau of Labor Statistics calls it, uh, uh, non-supervisory and production worker earned $4.73 an hour in, in 1973 dollars. And so you take that $4.73 and you divide it into the price of a good in that Sears catalog, uh, uh, say a 10 cup, coffee maker, drip coffee maker. Mm -hmm. I remember the stat. So the typical worker in 1975 had to work nearly eight hours to earn enough income to buy an, you know, a 10 cup drip coffee maker. And then you compare the, 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 that same worker today or his or her equivalent today, the income they earn today to the price of an equivalent good today, that same a kind of coffee maker. Mm -hmm. And today the typical worker has to work about a half an hour to earn enough income to buy to buy or 40 minutes to earn enough income to buy that coffee maker. And so if you do this for enough goods, you can see that, wow, at least, you know, for these goods that most people understand and, 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 and want to possess, uh, the amount of time that we have to spend working to acquire the income sufficient to buy the goods has fallen dramatically. Right. That doesn't mean that there aren't any goods in which the, the in fact, there are some goods in which the opposite has happened. But if you're just looking at, you know, an ordinary bundle of goods, uh, the, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that we've become a lot richer in terms of the amount of time we have to expend to acquire the income through working to get those goods. Yeah. And then also too, like when you start throwing in the quality adjustments, you I mean, in other words, like a TV in 1975 is not even the same thing as a TV today. Yeah. And if so, that's one of the benefits of that PowerPoint presentation that, that, mm -hmm. that, that I did at Texas Tech and, a number of years ago, I actually have pictures that I took with my telephone, by the way, on this presented through this thing called PowerPoint, I have pictures from the catalog. And anyone today can look at, you know, a TV from 1975, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a typewriter, which was a typewriter, students asked, from 1975, <laughs> uh, uh, a, a, a microwave oven, and see that the quality today is, is you know, different and, 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 and better. It, it, and, and that's true for a lot of the goods. And so, I mean, this is, as you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, some people argue that the consumer price index overestimates the rate of inflation because it fails to take adequate account of quality improvements. Right, right. Boston Commissioner. Let, let me ask you, um, related to this, so uh, there's a somewhat sophisticated response from like the populist right types, like a Tucker Carlson or somebody 
that it, it, again, or it, it could exist. And I've seen, you know, some people, um, and my listeners, my supporting listeners group on Facebook, they brought this up saying, you know, they're getting pushback along the lines of, oh, okay. Yeah. We're, we're not challenging that reducing tariffs or whatever might increase per capita GDP or standards of, but Hey, there's more to life than just material things. And you know, the problem with America today is not that we're suffering from not enough TVs or square footage in our McMansions. The problem is cultural or social or blah, 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 you know? So, um, what, what you know, do you, do you have a general response to that kind of a thing? So in other words, they're kind of conceding yeah. the nuts and bolts of it, but they're saying, you know, when, when Trump, you know, like like a, a corporation that lays off Americans and moves overseas. You know, that's not an issue of just dollars and cents. That's you know about patriotism. You know that that kind of mentality. What do you say to that? Well, there are a number of possible responses. The the, the first the, the first response that I, that I would that put forward is well, uh, then stop complaining about the economics of the matter. If you're complaining about Americans' paychecks being stagnant, uh, then I think you you cede the ground to to those of us who say, well, no, in fact, it has at least get your facts right. Okay. Right. Uh, and and, and 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 so we can all agree. Uh, I'm, uh, we can all agree. If if you agree with me that in fact uh, we are materially a lot wealthier today, then okay, then we can talk about at, at what cost are we materially mm-hmm. wealthier. Uh, but but don't start the conversation with look, you know, the free trade and and de- or deregulation, depending what that that has caused us to to be economically stagnant, right? All right. Um, so that, that argument that you mentioned, you're right. It, it, it gets pulled out very often. It typically gets pulled out after someone like me or you comes along and says, well, in fact, you know, Americans are, have, do have a lot higher living standards. Yes, but that's that's not really what we're talking about. We, we're talking about something deeper than m- material living standards. Um, and of course, I mean, no sensible person believes that the only thing that matters in life or even the ultimate thing that matters in life is you know uh, uh, how much, how many, how much access you have to to, to consumer electronics and, and and goods and services. There's a lot more to life than that. Mm. Um, but uh, 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 to to that, I say, well, uh, the, the if 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 for example, jobs are so important, as which is what people say. You know, having that job is so important. Uh, and then let the people who have those jobs, who who don't want to lose the jobs. Pay for that. What 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 the what the tariff proponents want is for uh, for me to be protected in my job by not having to take a pay cut, and for you to pay for it in the form of higher prices. If the job really is so valuable to me, because I I care more, uh, I care about this, just having this job than than the material goods that I can buy. I should be willing to take a pay cut to keep my job. If I'm not willing to take a pay cut, then I am disproving the premise. I'm disproving the fact that that uh, what Tucker Carlson says about me is true. I'm disproving the fact that 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 what matters that there's more to life than than how how much I get paid. Uh, it, it 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 can be true that that uh, what matters to me is more than just a paycheck. In which case, I should be willing to demonstrate that by willing to take a pay cut and keep my job. Uh, but it, it if that's true. Then, um, uh, then the case for tariffs is still weak because the case for tariffs is merely a case for shifting the cost to you, to someone else, to a third party, for me to keep my job. Okay, yeah, it, it be, yeah, and that's that's one of the things that I did too when I'm trying to isolate what's going on is that the reason the you know the the U.S. firm is outsourcing to India or wherever is because they're of cheap labor. So yeah, they wouldn't have to if the Americans would be willing to take a pay cut. Yeah. So the reason, yeah. you know, that, that there's an issue is that U.S. productivity is higher and wage rate rates are higher. If, if they weren't the case, then yeah, they would just keep the factory here. So you yeah. know, well, why and, is it that wage rates are higher here? That kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and as, as another, it's not, it doesn't quite get to the essence of it. There's another, n- another argument, and that is that, look, it's not just trade. Uh, you know, trading this kind of parents measures between 20 and 25% of the U.S. economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just trade that causes job job loss. Any change in the way consumers spend their money, uh, uh, including those that derive from p- pure demographic changes, any change causes some jobs to be destroyed and other jobs to be to be created. It, is, it, it makes no economic sense to focus on those changes that happen to come from transactions across political borders. There's no there's no economic reason to focus on 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 those jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, an example that that I like to use is. Uh, um, 
back about 20 years ago, Krispy Kreme announced it was uh, closing some of its restaurants because of the Atkins diet. Uh, mm. And probably validly so, you know, people as, as they shift to a high, more high protein, less carbohydrate diet, they want to buy fewer donuts. That's going to throw donut makers and donut sellers some uh, some of them out of out of a job. So we do do we tell Americans, no, 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 you got you got to keep at least buying the same number of donuts as before in order to to, to maintain to maintain those those donut jobs. Uh, we, of course, we wouldn't say that. Now, that, you know, this is a change that has nothing to do with international trade. It's everything to do with Americans changing their, their their diets. But if you lose your job because of American dietary changes, it does that's that's no less of a loss to you than if you lose your job because Americans buy more imports compared to buying uh, more domestically produced goods. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know we're running uh, low on the time here. So, do you, do you want to just is the last question for you? Is I know you're working on a book on James Buchanan. So maybe, you know, what, what's the book, what's the project, but also just for people, like a lot of my listeners, I think they're fans of the Austrian school. They've heard of James Buchanan, but can you give a commercial? Like, why do they need to, to know more about James Buchanan? James, but, but Jim Buchanan was one of the most important economists of the 20th century. Um, he spent the, the largest bulk of his career at George Mason. He won the Nobel Prize in 1986. He was not an Austrian economist, uh, as, as most people classify those things, but he's very sympathetic mm -hmm. to the Austrians. He's very much a subjectivist. Um, uh, he was very free market oriented. Buchanan is the single most important founder of the school of public choice, uh, using economic analysis, sound economic analysis, to try to make better sense of, 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 of collective decisions, political decision making and, and political outcomes. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things this this one of the things Buchanan was reacting to when he was when he first entered the academy back in the middle part of the 20th century uh, was you know, at that time, uh, economists were very adept at identifying market failures. Oh, you know, we get pollution, positive externalities. We need the government to intervene. And Buchanan basically said, and I'm summarizing here, of course, he said, wait, wait, ho hold on. Uh, yes, these there might be market failures, but they have the same uh, imperfect uh, individuals. Uh, operating in the government as you have operating in the market. And so let's look at how they operate in the government. Let's not just assume they know what to do and that they're they're going to behave with pure motives. Let's actually look at the motives that confront them uh, and, and the knowledge that confronts them and see how collective choices, public choices, compare with privately made choices. And of course, once that's done, the bias in favor of turning matters over to the state is dramatically reduced because people look at the state realistically just as they're looking at the market realistically. And so if for no other reason, then Buchanan uh, uh, made a powerful case for looking at government realistically. Uh, that's the reason why your listeners should be interested in in Buchanan's work. Okay. And, and you're working on, can you talk about yeah, what you're yeah. writing? The Fraser Institute has a series it's called the Essential Scholars Series. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and these are short books designed to introduce to a non-professional audience, a non-specialized uh, audience, the, basic, the the fundamental ideas of, of great scholars in the classical liberal libertarian tradition. Mm -hmm. So the first in this series was my Essential Hayek. That was mm -hmm. published in, I think, 2014. Uh, there's the Essential Adam Smith that's out that, that Jim Otteson wrote. St uh, Steve uh, uh, Landsberg just published the Essential Friedman. Uh, there's the essential Nozick coming, coming out and I'm working now on the essential, uh, Buchanan. I hope they have the manuscript, uh, to the Fraser Institute by the end of the, end of the spring semester. Uh, and again, they're, they're short, they're accessible. They're not written for fellow economists. They're written for people who don't know anything about the subject of the book, but right. the hope is they could read the book and, 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 and get the ideas and, 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 and appreciate their importance. Okay. Well, great. We look forward to seeing that. Um, thanks Don for your time. My pleasure. It's a, a good talking with you, Bob. I hope so, 2020 is a great year for you. <laughs> same, same to you. So, folks, this is BobMurphyShow.com slash 99. If you want to see, I'll have some links to some of Don's uh, posts and, and other information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see everybody next time.